My name is Stephanie Grant, and uh, I teach here in the MFA program at AU, and I co-direct the Visiting Writer Series uh, with Richard McCann, who alas could not be with us this evening. Um, and I have a couple of jobs this evening. One is to monitor your phones now, uh, make sure they don't make any noise uh, during our reading. Shut them off if you can. You know that this is um, the kickoff event in our visiting uh, reader series. There are posters uh, in the, on the back table uh, where the bookstore, the AU bookstore, uh, is also selling um, Enal Magnesto's uh, novels. All three of them are here, uh, so uh, please visit the back table. Um, and uh, please pick up one of our flyers. Uh, we have two other events uh, coming up this semester. On October 29th, uh, nonfiction writer and journalist Richard Rodriguez will be here. On uh, November 5th, poet um, uh, Patricia Smith will be here. Uh, so if you're interested, please um, please take one of those with you. Um, and we're maybe getting a couple more chairs, or we're, we're, we're almost ready to go. I think we're ready to go. Um, so it's my job and great good fortune uh, to tell you that Dinao Mangestu is currently the Lannan Chair of Poetics at a small Catholic university just down the road from here. <laughs> He's the author of three novels, The Beautiful Things That Heaven Bears, How to Be the Heir, and All Our Names. These books have brought him not only accolades, but some of the most prestigious honors of our shared literary world. The National Book Foundation's Five Under 35 Award, the Guardian First Book Award, the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, and the Prix du Premier Romain Étranger, and of course the tantalizing MacArthur Genius Award, and perhaps, if we're very lucky, later he will tell us about what it's like to receive that phone call. Before he takes over the podium and reads for us this evening, I wanted to tell you about a conversation that I was recently a part of. It's become quite common in the last five years or so for departments of literature to stage conversations about the relative value of a literature degree. These conversations are not frivolous. In fact, they've become common because of the current and ongoing global economic crisis, because of the real and overwhelming costs of higher education in the US, and perhaps because of our increasing unease as Americans in a dramatically changing world. In one such discussion in which I participated, my colleague, who isn't here this evening, Richard McCann, said in his usual emphatic way, when I was an undergraduate, I became a, literary, a literature major because I wanted to learn how to live and how to die. Everyone in the room laughed, but it was the laughter of recognition, not of distance and disdain. <coughs> Dino Mangestu's novels attempt to answer these grand questions by foregrounding the particular burdens of our time and place. His characters struggle to live ethically as Americans, as Africans, as citizens of the world, at a time when displace, displacement and migration, the violent remaking of national borders and its consequences is constant. What astonishes and sets Mengistu apart is that the novels take on such grand subjects in a prose style that is lyrical yet reserved, piercing and yet somehow modest. The novel the novels never show off, never condescend to the reader or to the characters. Even when in the midst of chaos, Magistu's characters are acutely alive to the possibility of genuine connection and to tenderness. Both the beautiful things that heaven bears and the newest book, All Our Names, favor an architectonic structure, that is the back and forth storytelling of A Tale of Two Cities or War and Peace, where the reader witnesses two narratives that begin separately but which ultimately converge. This structure does several things at once. It creates suspense, of course, allowing small gestures, like making a single misstep on a date, or spending hours on a college campus where, when one is not, in fact, a student, or walking outside when it is your job to stay inside. These modest gestures gain tremendous weight and momentum as we toggle back and forth between the two discrete storylines. It's true that the back and forth can momentarily confuse. Where are we in time? And which storyline caused what to happen? 
This confusion, or perhaps complication, makes us question cause and effect, makes us wonder whether what we are witnessing is indeed a series of causally related events, right? which is the definition of uh, plot in realist fiction, or rather a series of events without clear cause, or events whose causes are manifold and impossible to put in clear relation to one another. I could never find the guiding principle that relegated the past to its proper place, says Stephanos, the protagonist in The Beautiful Things That Heaven Bears. The trauma of violence is everywhere in these novels. Economic violence, state violence, revolutionary violence. And the narratives, like the protagonist, struggle to understand its most intimate implications. How to live ethically, indeed. One of the narrators of All Our Names tells us that Rescue is the true heart behind romance and fairy tale, the spontaneous love that frees us from the tower, hospital bed, or broken world. And so it is for rescue that we read, that we write, that we pursue literature degrees, however benightedly. And it is for rescue that we turn to Dinao Mengestu, whose spontaneous and egalitarian and tender love is on display in every page of these novels. Please welcome him now. Thank you all very much for coming. It's a pleasure um, to be here from that other place. That we shall not speak of. That doth not exist. Um, it's a real wonderful, I'm very, very grateful to the wonderful students and faculty here at AU for making me um, so welcome to, to be here. Um, it's my last year. Can you, can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> Somebody's looking at me like, I have no idea what he's saying. Um, okay, so just make sure that I'm, I'm, all, I'm audible. Um, I, was, I was thinking what you, about what you were just saying about the sort of conflation and confusion sometimes of the series. And I was just remembering that there was, after doing one of my first readings, for the beautiful things where the narrator of that novel owns a small grocery store in Washington, D.C. And there was a little girl in the audience, and she had the very first question. Um, and the question was, do you still own the grocery store? <laughs> it's such a good way to read, right? Like, what, a great way to, um, to be, what a great way to conflate certain parts of our stories together. Um, and speaking of, of conflating things, I'm going to read from, from all our names. Um, and it's a story, if you're not familiar with it, that's set between, that's sold between two different voices. One of them is a man, um, a narrator named Isaac, and the second part of the novel is narrated by a woman named Helen. And their stories, um, you said they converge. Um, and they converge not only in terms of the details, but as, in writing the novel, I was very interested in this idea in which our sort of political and cultural histories actually converge if we begin to think of them um, in less, um, definitive ways, right? If we stop thinking of them as like the things that happen over there versus the things that happen over here, when we align our narratives up together side by side, it's kind of what I attempted to do in this novel, things begin to kind of mirror one another. Our stories begin to have a conversation <coughs> in ways that they all too rarely get to do in real life. Um, but one of the great things about fiction is you can put people into a room and make them talk to each other um, in ways that they might not ever do. Sometimes, unfortunately, that conversation doesn't always happen the way they intended to. Um, and the passage I'm going to read here is from early in the novel, and it's told from the point of view of Helen. And Helen is a social worker um, in the Midwest, and this man, Isaac, has just come to her town, and she imagines that her job is to be the chaperone, Isaac's chaperone through the Midwest, because he's just arrived from Africa, and so she wants to be his guide through middle America. So Helen. I knew my time with Isaac was temporary. As visa granted him one year, and we never discussed the possibility of extending it. I did, despite my best efforts to stay grounded, sometimes imagine that one day we drive together to City Hall, nicely dressed, carrying simple silver bands picked up from the town's largest general store in our pockets, so that we could declare our marriage in front of a judge, in the hope that by doing so we would be able to make something permanent. A shared life which, as the saying goes, no man or woman could tear us under. I imagined us living on a large farm, far away from any town and family, with only chickens and acres of corn for company. 
How would you feel about living on a farm, I asked him. That depends, he said. Are you there with me? Maybe if you were good, I'd come visit on the weekends, I said. When it came to more domestic fantasies, however, we fell apart. The distance between what we had and what we wanted was too obvious if we dreamed too close to home. I remember taking him to the post office once so he could mail a letter to his mother. While we stood in line to buy stamps, I asked him what her name was. Isaac looked up as if he no longer knew the answer to that question or had lost the right to answer it. Her name doesn't matter, he said. Everyone only calls her Imaye. It means mother. When we reached the teller, Isaac handed me the envelope. He was shy of speaking in front of strangers, so I was the one who asked how many stamps were needed to mail the letter. While we waited, I tried to pronounce her name the same way he had. I said out loud, Imaya, Imayu. Not even close, he said. He pronounced it once more so I could hear how far off I was, and finally, after failing two more times, I laughed and said, forget it. When we meet, I'll just call her mother. He became silent. What I had said bothered him, and I didn't know him well enough yet to understand why, but I felt the distance expanding between us. We paid for the stamps and left the post office, and it wasn't until we were alone in the car that he told me what he was thinking. It doesn't do us any good to talk about things that will never happen, he said. I promised myself I would never ask him about his family again, and by and large, I stayed true to that. I thought as well, however, that if we couldn't have a future, I could at least try to make the most out of our present. We were running out of errands and chores to complete, and it was time I told him we moved on to something else. We're going to have to find other things to do, I said, except go to the grocery store. What would you like? I thought of all the possible options open to us. I thought of what normal couples did. They went to the movies, dinner. They invited friends over on the weekend. They had beach vacations. I know we couldn't get away with any of that, so I told Isaac, I don't know, but I'll come up with something. I decided over breakfast with my mother that certain risks had to be taken if Isaac and I were going to have any sort of life together. I didn't make this decision lightly. She asked me that morning while setting, the, while setting the table, do you have a new friend, Helen? She was dependent on gentle phrasing. That was the register we carried all our conversations in. Would you like to help me with the shopping this weekend, Helen? Do you think it's time we change the curtains in the living room, Helen? I always responded in kind. No one that I know of, I said but I promised to keep looking. The last time she had asked that question was shortly after I began working with David. I spoke of him often around the house, and if there was anyone I spent the weekends and evenings with, it was him. She asked me repeatedly if David was a special friend, a hope abruptly relinquished once she met him. Telling her about Isaac wouldn't have brought her any comfort. David was the only one who had suspected, and even he was quietly alarmed by the suggestion. When we were alone in his office, he said, I hope you know what you're doing. It wasn't a reproach. I had a feeling he found saying those words embarrassing, and so I nodded and tried to make it all seem lighthearted. Of course I know, I said. I'm a professional at this. We weren't divided like the South and had nothing to do with any of the large cities in the North. We were exactly what geography had made us. Middle of the road. Never bitterly segregated, but with lines dividing black from white all over town, whether in neighborhoods, churches, schools, or parks. We lived semi-peacefully apart like a married couple in separate wings of a large house. That was the image I had in mind during breakfast when I decided something different had to be done. Change it seemed to be everywhere except Laurel. I set my sights low. Incremental progress was my philosophy. We didn't have to be heroes. There had been enough of those already. And in many ways, I reasoned, Isaac and I had already picked up the fight. We just hadn't known that was what we were doing. I made a list of all the places we had gone to in the three months since we'd met. 
the grocery store, the mall, post office, bank, goodwill. I thought of them while sitting at my desk and tried to remember if any obvious signs of affection had passed between us. I came up with a crude value system to measure each trip by. One, shopping for food. After sex and children, what could be more intimate in America than choosing what kind of meat to cook? The grocery store was the first place in our town that I knew for certain we had conquered. We went once, sometimes twice a week. We laughed in the aisles, took turns pushing the cart. I gave Isaac cooking lessons at the meat counter. Those were all important victories. Two, the post office. I had to admit that it had been a terrible loss. And because it was a government office, I felt I had to weigh the defeat a bit more. One post office defeat was the equivalent of two grocery store victories. Mail was dangerous, personal letters especially. They pointed to great distances and old, mysterious lives I knew nothing about. There were tellers instead of clerks, forms that had to be filled. It would be difficult, if not impossible, to win in a place like that. Three, anything else that was related to shopping. Furniture, plates, cutlery. Isaac and I had chosen all that together right under the skeptical eyes of the clerks, and then he and I touched each other once. I would have said we dealt an important blow against segregation. But I had to be honest. I knew we had never touched except by accident, so I had to temper the victory with the knowledge that we could have done better. What I needed next were new targets. The first one that came to mind was the most obvious, and I couldn't believe I hadn't thought of it before. A week after our defeat at the post office, I called Isaac and said I wanted to take him out to lunch. To lunch. Yes, I said. For lunch. I'm tired of eating at my desk alone. I chose the same diner my father had gone to every morning, and where as a child I joined him on Saturday afternoons. It was the only place in Laurel that I associated exclusively with him. I had been going there for years on my own and with friends and co-workers, but those other occasions were mere intrusions on the central event. A semi-regular father-daughter lunch that had lasted for two years and that had ended in one of those booths with my father promising to visit every week once he moved out. A month went by before I saw him again. I stopped worrying and then with more time caring if he returned. Gradually, my memories of him were distilled into a single fluid image of a man confined to a booth with thick sideburns and occasionally a soft mustache that moved when he spoke, which wasn't often. The diner was never officially segregated, but I couldn't remember anyone who wasn't white eating there. In this case, it was etiquette and not a sign that served as a cover for our division. Before I left to pick up Isaac, I wrote down on a piece of paper, in case I forgot it later, we have every right to be here. We arrived shortly after noon when I knew the restaurant would be crowded. Isaac said he could meet me there, but I insisted on picking him up so everyone could see us walk in together. The lunch counter was already full. Of the half dozen men sitting there, I knew three by name, and the others were familiar. Bill, whose chest and forearms were known throughout Laurel for the strong black hair that sprouted from them, was leaning over the counter, half-heartedly la laughing at everyone who came and left. My father used to tell me to be careful with my food when Bill stood over us. He sheds, he told me, like a dog. In the scripted version that had played in my head during a five-minute drive from Isaac's apartment to the restaurant, the entire diner fell silent as soon as we entered. All eyes turned towards us, and we ignored them. We didn't hold hands. That would have been too provocative. But we did pause to look at each other with what I thought of as an abundance of affection. In the version we lived, no one stopped talking. Bill saw me as soon as I walked in and pointed to a table in the middle of the diner. Isaac followed me, but I was so focused on making it to the table that I never stopped to notice if anyone was staring at him. We took our seats. When I picked up my menu as a cover so I could look around the room, I realized no one had noticed yet how remarkable we were. Isaac saw my gaze wandering. Why are we here? He asked me. I looked around the room again. 
I thought I saw Bill and two of the men at the counter staring in our general direction. No particular reason, I told him. I just wanted to get out. I asked Isaac what he had done all day. I was at the library, he said. He described the book on contemporary American architecture he had been reading. I told him twice that it sounded very interesting. Fascinating, I said, what they can build these days. Chit-chat. Simple conversation. When Isaac put his hand on the table, I took his pinky and index finger in mine. I held them for two, maybe three seconds while looking at the menu. I used a strand of loose hair as an excuse to let go. Our waitress came and took our order. I ordered the fried chicken. Isaac pointed to the Denver omelet and let me order for him. After our waitress left, I turned my attention back to the counter. I wanted to tell Isaac what my father had said about Bill, but he was no longer there. And with him gone, the men at the counter stopped pretending they weren't staring at us. I tried to ignore them, but then our waitress came back empty-handed, and I felt certain that if I looked over again at them, I'd see them smiling. She was young, fresh out of high school. Had I been younger, I would have known who she was. She had a kind, round face and wore her dark brown hair in a bun. She leaned over and whispered to us, Bill wants to know if you would like to take your food with you. She was doing her best to be kind. Isaac understood immediately what was happening in the same breath, knew how to respond. Before I could answer, he told her, No, we would rather eat here, polite and determined. She nodded her head. She had no idea what else she could do. Isaac pursed his lips and waited until she had returned to the kitchen before turning his attention to me. Do you come here frequently, he asked. I nodded yes, then changed my mind, then said no, not, not really. Which one is it? I used to come here when I was younger, I said, but I don't that often anymore. And it was true. The diner was a few blocks from my office, but I went there once a month at most. We should go, I said. Isaac hadn't stopped staring at me since the waitress left, and I was tempted to confess my reasons for bringing him, but I realized I didn't have to. The best intentions didn't change what was obvious. I should have known better. I'm not going to run, he said. I'm going to eat my lunch. And briefly, I felt bold again. I saw myself adding this lunch to my column of victories once I returned to the office. If we made it through this, then perhaps there was nothing in the world that we couldn't conquer. From post offices to movie theaters and the all too perilous family dinner at home. I was imagining what my mother would say if Isaac were to show up one Sunday evening when his lunch arrived. The same waitress brought it, although this time she didn't look at either of us. Her embarrassment was evident. Isaac's omelet was on a stack of thin paper plates, barely large enough to hold the food. A plastic fork and knife had been wrapped in a napkin and placed on top, a strangely delicate touch that she must have been responsible for. He had wrapped the knife and fork and placed the palm-sized napkin on his lap. Do you mind if I start? I hate my eggs when they're cold. He spoke so calmly, I assumed he was joking. And I suppose to some degree he was. I tried to laugh. Ha ha. But then he cut into his omelet to seven even pieces before taking the first bite. He chewed slowly. With every bite I was reminded that we were no longer if ever on the same side. He had finished his omelet by the time my order arrived on the standard cream colored plates used for everyone other than Isaac. The waitress tried to walk away quickly, but I grabbed her wrist and told her I wanted to cancel my order. Tell Bill that I don't want to eat here. The poor child. She was struggling not to cry. We didn't make it any easier on her. Leave the plate, Isaac said to her. We're going to stay and eat it. She hurried back to the kitchen. I stared at the plate of chicken and mashed potatoes and blinked twice, childishly hoping I could make it vanish. Please, I said to him, let's leave now. He shook his head no. Not until we both finish our lunch, he said. That's what you wanted, isn't it? 
If that was his way of settling the score, then I thought I could play long just as well. For the next ten minutes, I slowly took my food apart. With my first half-hearted stab into the chicken, all the momentum was gone. There was nothing we could change. I felt a regression back to my mother's kitchen table where I'd spent many nights and afternoons laboring to finish a meal that my father had never shown up for and that my mother had refused. I had always known there was something cruel in her insistence that I eat every bite on my plate while my father's food grew cold next to me. She needed a victim besides herself. And when I finally looked up at Isaac after a few minutes and saw him smiling at me, I knew there was something slightly cruel lurking in his gaze. I was too busy, though, creating a new story to linger on that thought. And in this story, Isaac and I were still heroes. The fact that we chose to sit there and linger when every part of me wanted to run was proof of the sacrifices we were willing to make. When we left the restaurant and were back in the car, he said to me, Now you know. This is how they break you. Slowly. In pieces. Thank you. I'm supposed to implore you to ask questions. Please, beg, demand, threaten. I don't, know, I don't know what threats I have to offer from here. Shower you with water, I guess. <laughs> I'm happy to start. So, um, it's a great scene uh, because there's so much happening in it. And, um, Delightful to hear the resonance with um, James Baldwin's Notes of the Native Son and the um, very different attitude to the to the poor waitress who uh, who finds herself stuck there. But um, I wanted to ask about writing a sort of anti-heroic scene, right? I mean, as a revolutionary, Helen fails really miserably and immediately, and it, it's sort of a reminder, um, I think, as a reader, that that we often imagine ourselves heroic in a historical yeah. past, and yet unable to um, perhaps act in the historical present. And so I, I wanted to, I guess, just ask about writing that scene and, and envisioning, um, you know, the, the, the bad revolutionary. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I was, I mean, I, I, some, some people really don't like Helen, which I always find depressing, because I like her so much. <laughs> Um, or they think of her as sort of being really flawed and very, very naive. And I think she is, I think she's definitely sort of naive. But I don't think she's naive in the way that all of us sort of aren't, right? Like we sort of pretend that we can really imagine our ways into other people's lives and other people's things and that we could somehow alleviate one another's problems. Um, and Helen begins very much with sort of, not necessarily from that way, she's a social worker, but she begins um, with Isaac with this idea that somehow if their relationship is supposed to exist and needs to have a sort of public face, right? It's, and that's the same thing that continues with, with, the, with the homosexual relationships with Joseph um, and Isaac as well, that if these things don't have way of coming to life, it's hard to argue that they actually exist, right? Like if you can't actually move beyond the private sphere into a public one, how does anyone know you're actually really there? This idea that like you, you declare your existence by somehow like just walking outside the door and saying like, look, I'm here. Here I stand, here I stand with the person I love, the person I care about, um, and really to sort of take on and absorb the risks that come with that. So I, I imagine her beginning with that very, um, very innate, very sort of basic desire, right? Like she says, like, we need to go somewhere else. Like we can't just pretend to be um, these people at a grocery store. Um, something else needs to be happened. Something else needs to happen that moves this out of this sort of almost imaginary private realm. And that desire is, is, is sort of naive, but it's, it's such a basic thing that I think all people need to feel. Like you need to feel like you're, you're a part of something real beyond what you've imagined for yourself. And the problem becomes how she imagines that's going to play out, right? Um, and there's something slightly, I think, kind of cruel in Isaac saying that you need to stay here, but it's also his way of saying, well, if you want to sort of know who I am, then you have to stay here, right? Like the sort of cruelty of that gesture is the only way of saying this is what it means to actually experience what I live through, right? I don't get to walk out of this diner ever to some degree, right? I can walk out of here now, but I'm still kind of always there. I'm still always being looked at. I'm still always being, I'm still never, I never forget who I am. I never forget how people see me. And her desire to want to leave that 
is a desire to want to get off the hook a little bit too easily. Right? It's a desire to want to escape what's harsh and to think that somehow walking out actually ends the problem. And of course it doesn't. And so I think that's where her um, that's where her weakness lies, but she does stay there with it too. Um, she does sort of sit there and she recognizes like when she has that sort of idea, well, she perhaps she can invent another fantasy for the story, right? Another the fact that they've managed to persist means that somehow actually she has engaged with the story more than she thought she could, but um, Isaac kind of undercuts that again and says, well, now you know, actually, this is only the beginning, right? This is actually the sort of start of how you can sort of be destroyed by, um, by this type of quiet, but yet utterly insidious forms of discrimination and racism. It doesn't tear you apart locally anymore. Like we sort of, by the early 1970s, we've kind of moved beyond the overt forms of discrimination, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't continue to gnaw away at people behind it. So, yeah, so, um, you know, she's she's a. I don't want to say she's heroic. I don't want to, but I, just, I don't want her to sort of. I always hate that she's sometimes seen, especially by people, by the younger generations, like the students who have who I've spoken to in the past. They think, well, she's so stupid. Like, and I'm like, well, that's not true. Um, she just makes mistakes that you would like to think you would make, and I think that's a big part of it. Um, the other crazy thing people ask is like, well, that diner scene, that was like 1970, that would never happen today. <laughs> I was like, really? <laughs> That's what you think this is? Like, that would never happen? Um, they just shot an 18-year-old kid, and you're like, they would never discriminate against somebody in a diner? That's not the, that is not the hard imaginative leap that we need to make. Um, and by, and like, people ask me, like, even in the 1970s, how is that possible in America? Like, wow. Our, our desire to be ahistorical is like so perverse and weird, right? Like we want to sort of forget history. And this, um, it's part of the great things that this country can do, but it's so bizarre. Like, wow, that was like 1968. We were shooting something in the balcony of the hotel. Like we had, three years later, the world did not come to like kumbaya. Um, but somehow people want to like believe that these things have all excised themselves really rapidly because we're all sitting here in a room together. So great, everything has, has been fixed um, by the facts. It just changes, right? It becomes more quiet. But the gestures don't stop. That was only, that was only one question. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question about um, the end of this novel. Um, so there are obviously a lot of parallels and parallelisms between the two narrative stories. And um, I was wondering if the end was sort of, um, if it was meant to be intended, uh, if, if Helen's promise to return was meant to be as empty as uh, the original Isaac's promise, um, or, if it, or if it was meant to be you know, more of a happy ending, or perhaps just completely ambiguous. Yeah, how boring would it be if I gave you an answer? Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just, especially for those of you who haven't read the ending. Right. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no, uh, like, it was so sad. <laughs> uh, it was so happy. <laughs> yeah. in front of her. Um, I tend to, I, I, tend to I, I, I never ended a story um, with a very clear ending, right? I feel like if, if a novel or a story has a clear ending, then the narrative has come to a sort of definitive conclusion. <coughs> and if it's come to a definitive conclusion, that means the reader has no need to keep thinking about it. And if the reader has no thinking, if the reader has no reason to keep thinking about it, then I think the reader probably had no reason to read it. Uh, right? Like it's nice that like, you read things because they're frustrated by them, because they haunt you in weird ways. And that haunting is what I think um, becomes closest to our experiences and the things that we sort of love and that we that actually have meaning for us. Right? Like we don't remember the things that don't haunt us, <coughs> so otherwise they wouldn't be called haunting. Um, we forget the things that are easily interpreted and easily understood and that only have one singular idea behind them, right? Um, whereas the, the sort of hopefully over 300 something pages over any novel or a short story or even a poem, and what the story is trying to do, it's trying to kind of grapple with something that's ungrappable, right? It's trying to understand something that it can never fully understand. It's trying to come to know things that it can never fully know. Um, and those are human beings, right? You never get to understand the desires of someone's heart or someone's mind, including the fictional ones that you made up, um, which means you don't get to answer them, right? Like, because that would mean you knew answers for yourself that you don't actually have either. Um, so I actually don't know. Um, I have I have ideas for myself for where they go and how they end up and what my emotion, where my heart was when I felt like the story had ended. But that's such as that's also where I was in that moment when I when I wrote it. When I look at the ending again, sometimes it's mostly like, oh shit, maybe that wasn't 
else. Um, maybe that was worse than I imagined. Or maybe it was better than I imagined. Um, there's this sort of great, I was telling this joke about this professor who supposedly gave an exam to his students with only two questions. Um, the first one, choose one of the novels that you read over this semester um, and talk about what you hated about it. And the second question being, what character flaw in you does that point to? Um, and reading the end of a novel is sort of like that, right? Like whatever interpretation you come to becomes a reflection of who you are at that moment, right? So you read not because it's going to give you answers, but because you're finding some trait in yourself revealed. And when you're and really great literature is the literature that allows you to keep, not that I'm saying that's what I do, but like really great books, the books that I can't ever stop returning to, and the one is that every time I read them, I find something different about myself, right? Like I find a different interpretation than I was, because I'm no longer the same person. So how was that phone call? Did you have a phone call? <laughs> <laughs> From the McCarthy book. Um, it was funny. It was, <laughs> I, was, I, was in, I was in Kenya. Um, doing a festival in Nairobi, um, and I, I was, because the last time I was in Nairobi was when I was two years old when my family was emigrating from Ethiopia to America. Um, so we left in Addis, we went, my father was already in America, we couldn't get to America because we needed for the visas to work out. So we had an exit visa out of communist Ethiopia, enough to get us to Nairobi. We stayed in Nairobi for a couple months waiting to come to America so I could meet my father. Um, but I never went back to Nairobi. The second night I was in Nairobi, somebody called to tell me. I got a So, um, so some. They, they they were like, give us your bank details. I <laughs> know <laughs> um, they just had somebody show up, like, and the air dropped in. But it felt very, you know, we, we we always try to make narratives out of our lives. Like, right, we try to tell stories that somehow make things that are seemingly discoherent coherence. Uh, most of the time it's because we make them up, right? Because we force these things to fit into a logical pattern that's not real. And in this case, it kind of actually felt real, which was sort of really nice, right? Like that you'd come back to this place that you hadn't been to since you were a child and under much darker, dire circumstances where really we were, you know, we were, you know, my father had left for his life. We were there with very, very little waiting, waiting to leave and come to America. Um, and I felt very, yeah, incredibly grateful that the world had it inspired in such a way. The world does not inspire. <laughs> um, when you are writing your novels, do you ever write things that like, surprise you? Like in your stories, like like something takes a direction that you yourself expect? Oh yeah, hopefully every day. Um, that's when like I mean but, but unfortunately it doesn't happen every day. Most days I most days we just sort of spend like why do I do this and not now post anything else in the world? Um, shoveling snow in Antarctica seems like a more useful task. We're going to take the snow from that pile and put it in that pile. Because like, so you know there's at least something, like the pile's growing, something's happening. Most days of writing, nothing is growing, nothing is happening. Um, the great line from one audience quoting quote, the eulogy for me is, you know, it's like poetry makes nothing happen. Um, which that's on a much grander scale. Like, here I'm just like, nothing actually happens, right? Like, nothing, like, no words no sentences, but every once in a while you get lucky and things begin to um, emerge that you hadn't expected. Like I've never, I never know where my story is going from the day I begin, right? I have all these sort of ideas and preconceived notions. I spend my time walking around thinking, oh, that's going to be amazing, and then like that thing blows up. And then you sit down and write it and said somebody goes to a coffee shop, right? Like I think like so many other things were supposed to happen in that scene in my initial con concert in my head. I think they were supposed to probably eat their meal probably. I can't even remember what it was anymore. But whatever it is I set out for my stories to do, even that particular morning or the hour before I begin to write or the minute up before I write a sentence, is completely indeterminate, right? It doesn't actually have to be that way. And the best moments are when, when I don't know what's happening, but somehow the story is revealing itself to you in some degree. Like you, you've listened to the story and to the characters closely enough where um, they're making you and you're making them at the same time. It's sort of like you're, you're all sort of coming into formation. Your understanding of them and your understanding of yourself are sort of obviously inextricable. And they begin to take shape at the same time. Um, and it's the only pleasure you get out of writing, right? So it's the sort of great pleasure of writing. That's why you continue to sort of do it because you're, you get to, to some place of mystery that you wouldn't have been able to get to before. If I knew that, if I, I guess if I knew what the answers to my stories were, if I knew where I was writing from, um, 
I wouldn't keep trying to do it, I guess, you know, because I don't know where, you know, where my characters are, what will happen to them. Um, it keeps me coming back to them. It's the only reward you really get is that, right? Me? You um, have, do you, have you worked on several books at the same time, or do you... I know you write a lot of every other, you know, essays, and, yeah. and, and you're writing all the time in other uh, formats, but... In, 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 in the past, like, this book was kind of, was slowly coming into shape while the, while the second novel was coming to an end. Um, like, re, I mean, really, the second novel was pretty much almost over, and I had, like, a sentence for this one. And the same thing happened with the second novel. Like, by the time The Beautiful Things was over, I had, like, a paragraph for the second novel. Um, which is nice because you really are, um, you know, once you finish an album, you do like long times of like editing and waiting for things to come to print and like, not knowing if they'll come into print. And if you've got this other thing to hold on to, you know, it's like great because suddenly now you can put your heart somewhere else. Like your heart, you're sort of, you're done with that. You're not done with that thing yet, but you know it's going to be taken away from you at some point in time and you have to let it go. But at the same time, the things that are have compelled you to write that probably won't resolve anyway, right? So. Like, for me, all three of these books were because something was unresolved that I hadn't figured out about myself, about life, my family, diaspora, Africa, politics, violence, whatever the case may be. All those things somehow I, I was coming, I was figuring out what they meant and how to put my head around them. And so all all three books were in sort of in conversation with each other, and sometimes in, in concert with each other. I was going to ask, are there elements that that reappear and like? Like the coffee scene that arrived, you know, when the, you had first imagined it might be a different yeah. thing, and then you, in a book later, the, the thing that you were trying to steer towards, do you, um, do you pull them back up or not so specifically? Yeah. I'd say all all the characters. I, I made it. a reference, a joke earlier about the sort of terrible first novel that I spent all these years writing, um, and some of it was terrible, but all the ideas in that story were very true, and all the characters I've named in my novel since then have come from that book. Uh, so yeah. even like the town of Laurels actually was from this like fictional Midwestern town that I'd invented when I was like 21. Um, the characters of Joseph and Isaac were, those were names that existed for now 15, 12 years in my history, Jesus Christ, 15 years in my head. Um, so it wasn't from, the, it wasn't from, and, and actually the same thing, the beautiful things that and how to read the air characters are stolen from that first, so somebody, whatever happened with that first book that made it fail as a novel, uh, it kind of had a template of, of concerns that were kind of there. And so the characters aren't, are completely different in every single shape and way, but at least what kind of brought those characters to life was, was alive enough for me to want to hold on to them. Sure, and I guess I could even then have newfound uh, value or, or a import or something as you discover more things later on. Yeah. And just, yeah. I'm curious to know uh, to what extent the character Joseph might have been based off of Joseph Coney and the Lord Resistance Army. Yeah. Um, well, like, I mean, because Joseph actually was the, that terrible first novel. I, I feel like I need another adjective. That terrible first novel. But um, the father figure in that novel was named Joseph. Um, and actually, that's where he comes from. And, and the Joseph character, his last name is Mabira. Mabira is actually a natural part in, in the Gada that's under threat. Um, so actually, that's where. The name comes from the country. Like the biggest reference is actually from um, the sort of ecological space in Uganda that's um, rapidly being diminished right now. Um, and because also when I was writing it, I was never, I was never ever thinking about Joseph Coney. Um, and because this character in my novel is both sort of, he's a wealthy foreigner who grew up in the UK and is gay. Um, so are all pretty radically different from Joseph Coney in ways that you can imagine. I mean, it's like such a it's like because they are named Joseph, like that's the, that's basically the only thing that they have in common. Um, and I think that's, that's, that sucks for anyone else named Joseph in this world. Like, you, are, you are damned. Um, for only if you're Ugandan, um, which sucks for Ugandans named Joseph. But of course that's not true, right? They're, 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 they're much um, the sort of perversion that um, Joseph Coney is responsible for. Is its own terrible sort of thing, right? I can't even begin. To I just thought by the manner in which he was like, recruiting children for some of oh, yeah. but, oh, but campaign that, but, work. Yeah, 
liberating but villages. I, th I think I think one every every war has recruited children. Um, I would say that eighteen year olds we recruit for our wars are children, right? Like I don't I, I, I think it's a really strange thing that we sort of have latched on to the idea of African violence as being the one that recruits children for war. Um, go to any war zone anywhere in this world and tell me what I can find. Like the idea of ch children is one is not a fixed sort of thing. The UN the US isn't the only one of the only developed countries that has actually not signed on to the convention that bans us from arming children. We actually could recruit 16 year olds in our country. We haven't banned that at all. We don't do it, but um, the idea that somehow we are excluded from that is really not true. Um, but also that many, many other political figures across Africa have done exactly the same sort of thing. Like the violence that becomes um, inflicted is not um, as much. Almost every person in power, not almost every person in power, I'd say a lot of the, a lot of the leaders currently in power are, have done exactly those same sort of things, right? They're not, they're not exclusive to, to Cody by any means. So you were talking about how that like stories mean different things to different people and how in a different stage of your life they mean something different. Do your stories mean anything different to you when you think back over them or when you read them again? Does it change for you as well? Um, yeah, completely. Um, I mean, I don't, I don't I try not to ever reread them, I guess, but um, the beautiful things I, I sort of I get called back to much more so um, than anything else. And so that way, it's like a book that I'm still, I still kind of have to live with. Um, and so I look at it with a like, sort of like nostalgic fondness. I'm like, wow, that was such a nice thing to have, to have done. Um, not because I, because I think the book is that nice, but that, that moment in time when I was writing it and not being aware of anything else, like you know, being that age and being able to sort of write in a sort of empty vacuum of space and time has this sort of really great um, memory for me that you know that you, your life changes in ways that don't allow you to think of work or think of your writing in that same way. Um, and then also you were, I think I, you know, I, I grew a little bit more cynical, I guess, not cynical, but more 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 harsher in my perspective towards things sometimes, and so. There's um there's something hopeful about that novel in ways that I sometimes miss. What kind of challenges do you have writing two separate storylines? Like, do you ever like lose track of things? And off of that, what challenges did you have in all of our names, like writing from like a man's perspective and a woman's perspective? Um, I I well, because I because I write pretty slowly. Um, you have a long time to remember what happens, right? Like if you, it takes you like six months to write a chapter, you kind of know most of that chapter by heart. It's pretty hard to forget. And not like, fortunately, not that many things happen in my stories. So it's like you're, you're not that many characters, not that many like huge things. So the sequence of events remains always always pretty clear. Um, and it, and with this novel, it was it, sometimes it wasn't more, it wasn't, I, I mean, I really, Helen's voice was this strangely easy to paint easy place for me to write out of. Um, I sort of grew up in the Midwest in a town fairly similar to Laurel. I had like women in this sort of Southern Baptist church who helped like babysit me when I was a child that Helen was very much reminded me of. And so getting to her voice was an easy sort of thing to do. So I was like, oh yeah, I knew what those women were like and how they, uh, they, were, they, they had this great generosity and, and love for, for my family and for me. And they still do and I'm still in touch with them. So it's easy to find my way into her voice, and, and and Isaac was easy in other ways as well. Where I knew from him, I was taking experiences that I'd had as a journalist, right? So I sort of saw where some things were coming from. So like you asked earlier about the question of, of Joseph Coney, the easiest person that he he, he comes from was the sort of colonel you got in Eastern Congo that I'd spent time with, who was a sort of like um, short, kind of brutal man, but who was also really like he really loved his country actually, and really was trying to do something better for it. Um, and I saw him sort of do things that you probably shouldn't have done. Um, but they weren't because he was an evil person, but because of the mechanisms of power was sort of controlled by violence, right? That violence was, a, was the real political expression that was available. So that, I, so Isaac was coming from a place of more immediate experience sometimes. And so they both had, um, and, but that was, that was slightly harder sometimes, right? Because you knew that you had to some degree, a more immediate relationship to the things he was saying, whereas Helen was an imagination. Helen was kind of almost like a nostalgic creation to some degree of a time in a past that I could remember and walk my way towards. Whereas Isaac, I had to deal with the sort of immediacy of the things that I had witnessed and trying to figure out how to manage violence through him. Like it presented 
not only a character problem, but a kind of aesthetic problem, right? The aesthetic problem of like, how do you aestheticize violence? And how do you represent violence in ways that don't devalue or diminish the violence, but at the same time don't glorify it? Um, so that was much more, yeah, there was different parts of your brain working at different times. When you go to those conferences, like you were talking about in Nairobi, and such, um, how are you received as kind of like a transnational author, someone that talks about both, um, you know, America and North Africa? Um, well, I think it's like you, you, in different contexts, you, you have different sort of things. So, like when when, when I'm in Africa, oftentimes I have, I have very strong concerns about like having more African writers be able to write directly from their experiences in Africa. Right? Like I, I, I'm happy that I can sort of write from the things I know and that I've experienced, but I would also really think um, I can sort of wear and absorb and take on it. I do feel like I'm an African writer, but I just know that I'm writing from a different position than others. African writers are from who are actually inside of the continent and are actually are are at home, right? Like I, I'm writing also about America to the same degree that I'm always writing about Africa. So, um, so when I'm there, it's it's not so much as how I'm perceived by others, but how I sort of think of my relationship to to the, to the places that I've been. So if I'm in Nairobi, I'm very curious to have conversations with African writers and. Who are um, who are engaged with um, in, a, in a different way because it's their daily lives, right? They're not sort of imagining the things that I'm oftentimes imagining. Um, it's, yeah. Yeah, I just want to ask. This might kind of go into the you don't want to answer if you want to write it, but there were a couple moments that we were discussing in my class um, where David is asking or kind of talking to Helen about her relationship with Isaac. And the first one is, uh, why would I, he's, he followed her. Yeah. Um, when she went to visit him, and he says, why would I follow you, you of all people, Helen should be able to guess that, an answer to that. And then like toward the end of the book, he says, I wanted to see you with Isaac for purely selfish reasons. And we were kind of all guessing as to what that meant. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious what were the guesses. Uh, there was the guess that maybe he was interested in Isaac, and then there was the guess that, or, Kind of my thinking was that he sees himself as other in yeah. oral, um, and they're also in this other. So. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it's, it's um, you know I mean he's 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 obviously quietly gay in this story. And he's um, um, and in those lines, what I always said was that he's somebody who wants to see this possible, right? This idea that like here's something that is considered to be transgressive by the rest of the society, and yet somehow they're still able to get away with it, right? And to be able just to do this. he knows he's not able to sort of do that openly, and he knows that they aren't openly, that they're not doing it either, but just the possibility that they might be able to do so compels him to want to see it, right? Like, it's the sort of voyeuristic desire not to see necessarily even her and him, but the idea of her and him, the idea of two things that this culture, the society says should not be able to happen. Um, you know, for him, there's kind of hope that that's, that's entwined inside of him, right? Like, a hope and a kind of fear um, that you know, he thinks, well, if, if that's possible, maybe perhaps something, something else. You know, the novels, um, it's sort of really deliberately concerned with like that, those possibilities, right? Sort of the denial of sort of of interracial relationships as also kind of a continuation of sort of the denial of like homosexual relationships in Africa, really now. I mean, when I was writing the novel, I'm studying in Uganda in the early 1970s. I'm really, I was really thinking about like the sort of anti-gay laws that Uganda was passing today. Um, and that the US, that as in the US, as we sort of had this sort of strange debate about like, is this even legal or should it be legal? Like, what's, how is that really an argument, right? Um, and Europe having the same sort of problems, it just seems to me like that's, I, I'm, I know our children will look back and be like, what the hell are you guys doing? But, like, why would you, why did you have that debate? Why did you take it to 1970? 1972, for my historian, thank you, for to pass Love versus the State of Virginia that banned miscegenation laws. You know, like that was almost within my lifetime. Um, so how is that possible? Well, we want to make sure that we don't somehow exclude one discourse from the other. Like right? that, if you, if we're, on, if we're willing to understand that that is somehow sort of absurd to sort of ban that, then we should be pretty comfortable being like this is not a real thing, right? This is not okay. Um, I have a question that requires 
Okay, never mind. I'm just gonna say. Um, so, so I guess I've heard you like sort of talking about reading and writing both as these like self-revelatory exercises, where like the your reaction to something you read is says something about you, and so is the things that you write. They they also say something about you, and the, and the process of doing the writing is uncovering that. So I'm wondering if you read other authors, the is the thing that prompts you to go in and take a closer look or, or to read something again in greater depth, is it first the, uh, is it the, the book that excels at provoking a, res a particular response in a strong way from you, or is it the book that excels in some aspect of crap? Because I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm thinking that those two things must work in concert. Yeah, yeah that, that's interesting. Um, and it, and, it's, and it, like, it brings like, the, the tension of like, the, the centrality of the sort of I and the you and the sort of the instruction or the inter interpretation of literature is like, sort of thing that I obsessively return to. I'd like if we begin with just the sort of I think I think it's really easy to end up with this really narcissistic type of fiction, right? So there is this I that I think of as really important that I sometimes really closely attuned to like the stories and the craft things that I love. So like I reread Marilyn Robinson's housekeeping kind of constantly, right? Because it's just a sort of miracle, beautiful book. And I read it because I'm reminded of how gorgeous sentences can be. The same way that I go back to poetry a lot when I'm writing, um, because poetry gets me back to sort of how language can get closer to, to the ineffable, um, and that language sort of carefully crafted is able to sort of move us in ways that we oftentimes find unexpected. And then that kind of always gets coupled with the sort of like, I think you have to be very skeptical about your perspective, right? Like, so whatever approach that I have, whatever attitudes that I may have, you try to make sure that your characters become sort of better than the limitations of your own gaze. Your own gaze is like deeply flawed, regardless of how moral or ethical you may think you are. The moment you begin to assume that morality or that ethical position, the moment you're probably screwed because you've assumed a sort of infallibility that you don't have. Right? You've assumed an objectivity that you don't have. But at the same time, I know I have these things that I care about, and that's a very sort of political sort of decision, right? Like I write because I think there are things wrong sometimes in the world that I want to figure out. Um, and the older I get, the more I write, the more I think, the more I, the more I find myself deliberately trying to think of writing as like this sort of, as an act of willful engagement, as an act of sort of like thinking about the world and saying, I'm, I'm not just writing from the things that I think are important to me because I experience them with the things that I think are sort of like really important in our cultural conversations, right? Like violence, um, sort of discrimination, and sexuality, all those things that are. Oftentimes we worry about them finding their way into fiction because we think that that turns our novels into these sort of political vehicles, and they easily can, but can also be the thing that like really expands the perspectives of our characters, right? Because then suddenly you actually set yourself, you as author, become less significant. The more you begin to expand the range of your characters' concerns, the more your characters step out into the world, the more they begin to sort of become greater than you, right? The more complex their vision becomes the more they become not about the things that you think are important, but about the things that are important to them because suddenly now they live in this world, in this time, they have these politics, they have these things, they have these violent actions, these beautiful actions that take place, and you have to try to figure out how that happened to them. And you just keep trying to push them out further and further. You keep trying to let them go farther away from you into this world. And the more they do so, the more you take on, um, the more you find yourself trying to figure out like does that, how does that happen to people, right? How do they become brutal men, or how do they become um, lovers when they shouldn't be? That's a great place to end. Great. So, thank you. Thank you.